In the ancient landscapes of Australia's Kakadu National Park, Glenn Robles, a 13-year-old veteran tour guide, led a group of international tourists on a four-day adventure. Among them were two German sisters, aged 21 and 23. The sisters were natives of Munich, Germany, and were on what was supposed to be the trip of a lifetime. Freshly graduated with a degree in interior design from the Technical University of Munich, Isabel was known as a young woman full of ambition and creativity. She was highly regarded by her peers for her keen eye in aesthetics and a passion for sustainable design. She'd already garnered some national attention, in fact, from the design community back home. Isabel's trip to Australia was not just supposed to be a vacation, it was a celebration of her recent academic achievements and a well-deserved break before she dove into her budding career. Accompanied by her 21-year-old sister Valerie, the journey was meant to be a joyous occasion, a chance to explore, unwind, and also make lasting memories. The group also included James Rothwell, a young Brit from Essex, and Carmen Woolley, another German tourist. Glenn was not just another tour guide, he was in fact a maestro in his field and highly renowned in the tourism industry. Originally from the coastal city of Darwin, he had always been captivated by the untamed beauty of Australia's wilderness. This passion of his would lead him to taking up a career as a tour guide, the kind of job that made 9-to-5ers question their life choices as he scrolled through his adventure-filled social media feed, much of which included videos and pictures of him introducing travelers to the awe-inspiring vistas of Kakadu, its ancient aboriginal rock art, and of course its vibrant ecosystems teeming with a variety of unique wildlife. But even in a paradise like this, danger also lurked. Warning signs about saltwater crocodiles were as ubiquitous as the breathtaking views. These signs, translated into multiple languages, served as stark reminders that the beauty of nature often comes with risks. They were sort of like dissonant notes in an otherwise harmonious symphony of natural wonders. On what was the very last night of their trip, the group had set up camp near Sandy Creek Billabong, a waterhole so serene that it seemed to defy the warning signs staked around its perimeter. Despite his experience and an area of glaring signs, it was Glenn who at this point would have a crucial lapse in judgment. A pile of mussel shells on the shore seemed to suggest that local aboriginal women had deemed the water safe, and to add on to his growing sense of security, even a flashlight scan for crocodile eyes would yield nothing. Glenn was at this point convinced of the water safety and would give the crew the all clear. One rightly cautious backpacker would even question him three times, but Glenn would go on to reassure him that he'd been making the right call. The group, including the Von Jordan sisters, took the plunge, their laughter echoing in the night air. Andrew Waters, a British tourist, would stay ashore, engrossed in his attempt to play the didgeridoo. do. It was at this point that in a heartbeat, the atmosphere would shift from one of carefree jubilance to palpable dread. A sudden, horrifying realization swept over the group. Isabel was nowhere to be seen. The laughter which had filled the air just moments ago would then morph into gut-wrenching screams and the once playful splashes turned into frantic strokes as everyone made a dash for the shore. James Rothwell, who had felt a bump against his leg, initially thought that it was a prank by one of his friends, but now he understood the grim reality of how close he was to sharing Isabel's fate. He was among those who reached the shore first, his heart pounding in his chest as he grabbed a flashlight. What he saw next was a stuff of nightmares, the glint of a crocodile's eyes illuminated by the flashlight's beam, moving away from the group. And like a scene straight out of a horror movie, Isabel could be seen in its jaws as a crocodile then retreated into the dark, murky depths of the billabong. On the shore, Andrew Waters dropped his didgeridoo as his face turned ashen. He too had also heard the screams, and like the others, had initially thought that it was a bad joke. But after the frenzied scramble to shore and the subsequent headcount, it became painfully clear that Isabel was missing and the group was now facing a horrifying reality that would haunt them for the rest of their lives. Emergency services were summoned and a harrowing night-long search would commence. The park rangers, armed with harpoons and flashlights, scoured the billabong and its tributaries. And in what was a race against time, despite their best efforts, it wasn't until the next morning that they'd found what they'd been dreading. Isabel's body was discovered in the tributary of the South Alligator River, about two kilometers from where she'd gone missing, and the crocodile responsible for the attack was a behemoth, nearly 4.6 meters long and weighing about 500 kilograms. It was later harpooned and Isabel's body was retrieved, but not without difficulty, as another large crocodile menacingly circled the area. After Isabel's body was found and the crocodile responsible was identified, questions would begin to swirl about why the crocodile had chosen to attack Isabel and not someone else in the group, such as James Rothwell, who once again had felt the crocodile brush past him and was left pondering why he'd been spared. Gary Lindner, a Kakadu ranger involved in the search and rescue operation, offered an intriguing theory during the inquest. With a notion of caution acknowledging the sensitive topic, he suggested that the crocodile may have targeted Isabel because she was small and female. 
He also went on to recount an experience where he'd seen a crocodile act aggressively toward a boat carrying women, while completely ignoring a nearby boat filled with men. With due respect to the women in court, he mused, I've always wondered whether factors like the menstrual cycle could influence a crocodile's behavior. From a scientific standpoint, crocodiles are known to be modal, natatorial, and sedentary, which means they're highly mobile in water 